Today, I'll be interviewing Evan Yu, the creator of Vue.js and Vite. He'll be giving a talk at the Vue.js Live conference in London on May the 12th. And for more information on that, there is a link in the video description. So welcome, Evan. It's an honor to have you. Thanks for stopping by. Great to be here. Awesome. So let's get started with some really quick uh, lightning round questions, icebreakers, nothing controversial at all. Tabs or spaces? Um, I'm currently using spaces, although I don't have a super strong preference. Like I can go with either, but most of my projects are in spaces. Cool. Um, so semicolons or no semicolons? No semicolons. <laughs> no semicolons. Wow. That is controversial. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Mac, Windows or Linux? Mac. Mac. Okay. And tea or coffee? Coffee. Ah, awesome. All right. Well, let's get into the uh, to the actual questions here. The real questions. Evan, at the conference, you're going to be talking about Vue.js feature updates. What can we expect from this talk? Can you give us just a small preview? Sure. Uh, so we are we've been working on 3.3 for quite some time now, and it's currently in beta. Actually, just went into beta last week, um, and we're just doing st mostly stability testing and updating, preparing the documentation updates and all that. So if you're curious, you can read the alpha and beta releases change log. Obviously, we're going to have a more refined change log at this when, when we release stable. But um, there are quite a few exciting features coming. So uh, a few important things to mention. Um, there's the new define model macro, uh, which makes it easier for you to uh, declare a component that accepts V model usage. Previously, you need to manually declare a prop and a match an event listener, uh, which has been kind of tedious to use, uh, but uh, the new macro will just make it a breeze uh, in most cases. And then there, one of the most requested features regarding uh, script setup and the, the macro usage is when you use the, a macro like define props with types. Previously, there was the restriction on when you when you refer to external types. Now this has been largely resolved, so um, it should work in most cases uh, based on our, on our beta testing. So um, it was a pretty challenging over undertaking, but uh, we, we managed to do it. So I'm pretty happy about that. And then there are um, a few other quality of life improvements like define options. Um, we also did a few uh, longer term things like um, so previously uh, in view, we, we implicitly register the global JSX namespace uh, for TSX users. And this has caused some issues when you have both VN and React in the same project. Like, it, I know it's not very common, but some users do run into situations like that when you have a like mono repo or something. Um, so we've managed to, uh, migrate to a new, so, so we use a new thing called, um, the JSX runtime convention so that you can configure TypeScript to say, okay, for this file specifically, I want to use this JSX definition so that there will no longer be big conflicts, but, um, this is going to be technically a breaking change. So what we're doing right now is in 3.3, we're actually already migrated to this new usage, but we still register globally by default. So everything will work as is, but you can start migrating to the new usage. Uh, and we're already doing that with, with uh, all the IDE support like Volar, um, where we're work, uh, already uh, communicated this with uh, to the JetBrain guys uh, working on WebStorm. And um, so you'll have plenty of time between 3.3 and 3.4 to for this and um, so it should be a pretty smooth migration one of the more important things i want to mention is the, the generic support um so um this has actually been working in olr for quite some time but now you can uh so this will be become stable in 3.3 where uh you can actually use a single file component and have generics so yeah which is also a long awaited feature so a lot of things that we've kind of felt difficult to do, so we kind of delayed them, but we just uh, decided to do them in 3.3. So that's pretty cool. Nice, that's exciting. Yeah, I can't wait to hear more about that at your talk. So Evan, moving on to our next question, Vue and JavaScript in general, 
they have evolved so much over time and, and these things you know they just keep getting better and better what are some of the the what's the future of view or and or javascript in general like for instance there's a ton of really cool things coming up in ecmascript proposals is there anything you're excited about uh yeah so actually not just in javascript but i guess there are a few uh web platform features that we're pretty excited about for the future the first thing is uh in css there is a new scope proposal so uh the native at scope syntax allows you to uh very easily use it as the underlying implementation for the view's current scope style uh feature right right now what we do is we actually have to simulate it uh, when you have style scope in a view single file component, we have to simulate it by compiling your CSS and adding all these special attributes on your rendered markup. Um, but with the, uh, when the new scope proposal land natively in CSS, we will be able to migrate over to that. And that'll remove a ton of complexity from within views implementation. So we don't have to do all these compilation and transforms anymore, and it'll should have better performance as well so uh, that is one thing we're really looking forward to uh, another thing is um, there is a new proposal called async context uh, I think that's stage three I could be mistaken it could be stage two but um, so essentially allows you to uh, have a context that you can track across a series of async function calls so when you have an async call stack, you can have one contact that is consistent through all the whole stack. So what this allows us to do is to the inside script setup, right? Inside script setup, you can actually use await right now. So right now, again, we simulate this by using some compile time magic to inject these context restoration code between your await statement, await statement. Uh, so that when you after you await something, you're still in the same component context. But with async context as a native feature, again, we can get rid of all these compile time hacks and just use the native feature. And we'll be able to extend that to non-single file component usage as well. So uh, essentially, these are the things that allows us to basically, we previously we had to use compiler. Um, I, I don't want to call them hacks, but like we had to leverage the compiler to do very complicated things in order to simulate what we want but like some of these things are becoming native features and then on the dom side there's this feature called uh dom parts this one is like super early it's like someone at google is working on it and they have like a prototype and a very early proposal but it's essentially designed specifically for uh it's almost like designed for vapor mode uh so vapor mode is this new compilation strategy they were exploring that's kind of related to uh inspired by solid and um one of the tricky part is when we instant instantiate a large chunk of dom template how do you efficiently locate the nodes that should be dynamic right right now you have to kind of generate code that traverses the dom tree with like next sibling call uh, so that can be cumbersome. It can also generate a lot of unnecessary code. So DOM parts is essentially a proposal that allows you to instantiate a fragment of DOM. At the same time, it just directly returns you the parts that you're interested in. So it, it, I think you use something called, um, I forgot what they are, what they're called, but it's like some special markers in the, in the HTML that you're instantiating. And when you instantiate with DOM parts, it just like directly gives you all those parts back. So you can start binding to them. Uh, so again, like we can do this by compiling things, right? But uh, it's always nice to have the platform support them natively. So these are the things we're really looking forward to. Yeah, those are really cool things. Uh, it makes makes your jobs easier. And it's just uh, it's so many cool things that are that are about to come out. And so can't wait for that. Now, um, Evan, the next question, and this is the big question of the day the role of ai how, how do you see ai uh, working into software development yeah um so i think there are a few different phases for this i think in its current state um 
In its current state, it can help us uh, simplify a certain category of tasks, like how to write a GitHub GitHub Action file, how to write a certain configuration file, how to write this Bash script. Right? These are the kind of things that don't have a lot of inherent technical complexity. It's mostly like the know-how, and um, even as a very experienced developer, you may need some time to just Google around and find, oh, how do I exactly do this? And this is what AI can kind of accelerate by quite a bit. So if your main task and your main job is just like a lot of know-hows and then stitch them together, AI can help you a lot of with that. But if that is also your entire job, then AI is taking away a lot of value from you. So your value is essentially distilled to how to stitch all these things together. It's kind of a double-edged sword. If you're a, if you are an independent creator, AI can help you a lot with that because it makes you much more productive. But if you are just working for someone else and doing this kind of repetitive or uh, putting things together kind of job, um, I think there is a future where um, someone builds a higher level system that is able to leverage AI and stitch things together as a higher level system to replace certain kind of jobs. I think that is a possible future. But um, but again, like as I said, it's limited to a certain category of things. Like there are other category things like system level engineering or say writing a framework or um, being the architect to decide the whole overall stack or everything for a whole project, right? I don't think AI is there yet. Uh, so uh, language models are also essentially not really good at solving problems that haven't don't have a lot of shared experience on the web, right? So there's certain kind of expertise you can't just get by Googling. So if you can't get them by Googling, it's not available on the internet then the language model has nothing to be trained upon. So it will never, you know, acquire that kind of skill. So um, I think there's the, there's the limitation of, of language models. Uh, another aspect of it is um, correctness problem. When you're working with code, correctness is kind of a hard requirement. So if, if you're just trying to get something that can some, somehow works, right? And can get you there fast. But if you're requiring something that is correct, testable and maintainable, uh, you probably will be disappointed, right? Uh, and and you'll ha you actually spend, end up spending more time fixing the code that AI gives you. Uh, and th at least that's what is happening right now. Um, but it could improve and the speed of the whole ecosystem that is moving is insane. So I don't know when is the next the, the, the quantum leap. Right, because right now, like when, when GPT 3.5 gets blown up, everybody was like, "Oh, like this is such a huge leap. It's unbelievable." So, uh, but if we don't get the next leap, I think LLM is still just like um, it will only be able to replace replace a certain non-important category of job. Like it, it, it's more like an assistive technology that makes certain people more productive. But uh, there's still quite a long way to go before it can completely replace uh, engineers. Yeah, so it definitely can speed up an engineer's uh, workflow, but uh, probably is not going to write the next JavaScript framework, right? Yeah, like it, it helps me in certain mm -hmm. ways. Like when yeah. I was uh, debugging GitHub Actions, I would just ask it, like, how do I do this? Yeah. It's exactly. very helpful. And when I'm writing documentation, I'll just write a draft and ask it to proofread it for me, improve the flow for me. These are the kind of jobs it's really, really good at. Yeah, right? yeah. yeah. But I awesome. like... I can't just throw a GitHub issue at it at, at yeah. the at the AI and say <laughs> they fix it. Fix this bug for me. It just doesn't, <laughs> doesn't work that way. Nice. I wish yeah. it could though. And maybe, maybe, who knows? I mean, I just got access to the GPT four API, so I'm I'm excited to play around with it and see see what, what's possible. It, it's you know, it's definitely uh, going to be something to keep an eye on in the you know, the near future. So Well, Evan, again, I appreciate you stopping by, talking to us about um, the Vue.js Live Conference. Again, that is going to be, uh, you'll be there live in May on May the 12th. So uh, thank you again for stopping by and uh, we'll see you in, uh, in London. Thank you. Looking forward to see you there. <laughs>